Don't listen to these people. It doesn't continue forever. Finally, the markets go, you know what? It's not true. So this is my biggest concern. And, and we talked about that at the outset. We don't want the failure. We need a parallel system to develop because it's not ready yet. It's developing. We know what it's called. It's called the Bitcoin standard. But in the interim, you need a parallel network. And in a network transfer, you don't turn one network off and immediately go all in on another network, right? You run two networks in parallel. Greg Foss, welcome to the show. How are you doing, man? Happy to be back. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Greg, um, um, I heard you talking uh, on this event with uh, organized by Mark Moss. Okay. It was funny because um, you started off by, uh, um, I didn't know that anecdote that, or anecdote, a little detail uh, that your sister is a stand-up comedian and she's like one of the, like, uh, like what in, within five years, she's like- Well, the- she's been nominated. Yeah, correct. So thanks for watching that show. Yeah, I, it didn't come out quite as clearly as I had hoped, but I looked, I, I, I re-listened to that part. So my sister is a stand-up comedian. Um, she has been nominated over five different years, five separate times to be female comedian of the year in Canada. And the best she's done is come in second three times. So wow. pretty good, right? But she's never won it. So, okay. uh, but she's, she's solid. She's been doing it for, damn, I'd say she's been doing it for 30 years as well. And it's pretty nerve wracking. So I was on stage with Mark at his event and I was the first guy to go on stage. Like, they kicked off the event and I was the first guy and uh, I was nervous because, you know, (laughs) when you, when you're on a stage, like in Miami and there's, you're on stage with Jeff Booth and Preston Pish. I mean, you can, you can, you know, absolutely freeze and the other guys will pick up for you. Right. But Uh when you're all by yourself for 40 minutes, it was uh yeah, different experience. Yeah, but it wasn't like the first day, the first time you were on stage, right? I mean, you've had like. Um, you know what? I will tell you the truth for 40 minutes. Um, yeah, it, it, it probably was the first time I've ever done a 40 minute solo presentation. You know, I'm totally comfortable doing 25 minute presentations. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. Your presentation was brilliant. It was so compact and everything. You just put packed everything inside. Like, oh, well, it was thanks. entertaining. You know it was infotaining and entertaining. You brought oh, thanks, over. man. You know, uh, Mark Moss is a great guy. Yeah. Um, I learned a ton at that conference. Um, I was lucky enough to be a guest speaker, so I didn't have to pay to go, but it was very worth my time to be there. I met some people, great people, firstly, diverse backgrounds, really important. Um, I met some, you know, I met doctors, I met uh, um, scientists doing work on um, on fertilizers, for example, for green fertilization. It was just a very interesting conference. I met some girls that are trying to uh, stop uh, uh, child trafficking uh you know uh young women who get yeah. kidnapped and That's used a huge for, problem. Uh, it's a huge problem it's an understated problem to be honest oh man it blew it's, my mind especially in so. the upper league you know when you hear about epstein and the max wow wow I mean, that's you just, know it's just on the sort of elite pedophile exactly whatever. as a father as a father of a younger daughter exactly me too man it's sick so but on, on the positives yeah you know i i uh, i really enjoy and i love uh what mark moss is trying to do for the world so a big fan of his yeah you know uh, the reason i asked you why your sister uh, you know is a stand-up comedian because i think uh my opinion is that you know um artists or uh, stand-up comedians i think you know they don't have only <coughs> entertaining role or purpose i think they have a huge responsibility if i may call it but also like a purpose uh, like a uh, intention i think behind it i mean if i if you ask your sister like why are you doing this like what kind of content what kind of purpose you know what drives you that would be interesting you know what would what, what you would say i mean can i ask you like what kind of content because it's about education i think you can want to make right. people laugh about yourself you yeah. know like bring everything with humor and transport, you know, and communicate all this, the content, you know, the problems we have, yeah. and the structural things we have, especially, you know, when it comes to money, to central banking, to whatever, to all the uh-huh. structural problems. I think, 
yeah, it would be interesting, like what kind of effect or impact uh, uh, stand-up comedians, artists have on, you know, the general perception well, of people. Let right? me tell you that um, for certain, uh, she's very witty and uh, wit is a sign of, uh, you know, a, a different levels, a different level of intelligence. You know, she doesn't understand too much about finance, but boy, does she understand about life. Uh, she's able to crack uh, jokes about herself. Uh, it's it's entertaining, and she has a twin brother, and so some of her shtick with my with my brother, uh, my brother and sister are three year younger twins, and uh, she does a really good job playing that angle. So yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, I think it's a you know it's a huge potential. Uh, if you because you know a lot of people don't want to listen to. Or they don't want to, you know, they don't have maybe the time or the the energy or the, you know, the bandwidth somehow to 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 absorb this the knowledge, the comprehension. And I think, you know, what if your sister? I was just thinking, you know, what if your sister, you know, started like uh, educating in a very like entertaining Look, this way about Bitcoin? Nothing is that impossible, a- right? I mean, inherently, <laughs> everybody in all walks of life understand there's something wrong mm-hmm. with being given money on a regular basis and not having to pay it back. You know, even, even the most uh, selfish person has to understand that when the government gives you money, essentially what you're doing is pulling forward uh, gains, future gains at the expense of your children and people who, you know, that just sits there because you take it one step further and you say, well, if the government's going to give me money, why do I actually have to pay taxes then? Like, and why do we even, and then you take it a little further and you go, why do I even have to work? Which is really scary. But, you know, I know that most people understand there's a, uh, a cost to it. They just don't know how to identify and put their finger on that cost. And then when you start thinking about it is pulling forward gains at the expense of your children, then it gets pretty serious. So, Greg, I want to talk to you about, um, first of all, I want to, um, because I, I want to direct my listeners, you know, I mean, there's tons of materials, especially lots of interviews with you, like, you know, brilliant interviews uh, oh, on, on all kinds of channels. And so I want to direct them to, to those interviews. But I want to talk about, like, what, how, how do you see, like, um, in the process of uh, Bitcoinization, hyper Bitcoinization, and this in this hopefully gradual uh, and and smooth transition, and not you know abrupt or uh, you know sudden unexpected. Hopefully and, not and, abrupt. Yes, hopefully exactly. not abrupt. Yeah, um, you know because in Austria, I mean we're talking about Austria. You know, like in the center of European Union, um, there's a law. I mean, um, I mean we we we're, we're facing tyranny. Maybe not as bad as 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 it is in australia right now but i think you know you we cannot talk about bitcoin uh without talking um you know we can't talk about bitcoin without talking about like the the structural problems we have the existential problems we have Um, so there's a law prepared in austria if that goes into effect in the previous uh version a draft of it uh, foresaw like a like they considered like a not only a fee penalty but if you can't pay it or if, or whatever it goes to a certain uh, you know uh, amount then you could uh, literally go to prison you know uh, so they took that out so if that that latest draft goes into effect it means like uh, mandatory vaccination it's about mandatory vaccination just to yeah. you know, <laughs> make it short and 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 then they will uh, penalize like if you don't if you don't uh, you know go and uh, you know put put that uh, uh, um, experimental substance you know yes. <laughs> into your into your body then uh, they're going to penalize you with uh, starting with 600 euros and then up 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 wow. And uh, yeah, um, and we'll talk about like mandatory vaccination, not pushing, you know, for vaccination of children, you know, kids, like starting yes. with what, five, seven years old or whatever. So, um, so I want to like, you know, bring in like a new perspective here, like from, uh, from your perspective, like yes. how do you see this uh, um, Bitcoin and, and this transition, hopefully, you know, free us from this uh, tyrannical regimes, whatever we call it, dictatorial. Okay. Regime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's uh, let me just comment on uh, what I believe first is um, I don't believe in the mandatory. Uh, I believe it should be by choice. Um, I'm a big believer in mathematics, as you know, and uh, I personally know three people personally. I know three people who have been vaccinated three times. And they just got the Omicron. 
Okay, that's in Canada. Three people jabbed three times yeah. and they've got the virus. Now, does it mean that uh, it's less severe? Potentially. But this whole thing about mandating the vaccination to prevent the, uh, uh, the spread of it, well, I don't know. I don't see it preventing in those three people and, they, and they've been jabbed three times. Personally, I've, I've been vaccinated. It's to simplify my life. Um, but if I had children that did not want to do it, I would certainly not force them to do it. And if I had a pregnant daughter, or excuse me, a daughter who was trying to get pregnant or she was pregnant, I absolutely would not uh, it, uh, force her or even try to force her to do it. Okay. That's my personal view. Um, do I understand people who are scared? Yeah, I understand it. That's people who are scared because the government's made them scared. You remember when it was called the flu? You remember this thing called the flu? Um, my personal opinion, and you can send me hate mail if you want. Um, I just view this as a severe flu. Uh, I'm a, not a doctor. I don't pretend to be one. I just look at the mathematical stats and I know how many people were passing away from annual respiratory sickness during flu season around the world. And if this was a true pandemic, you would have seen a material spike in global deaths. And you haven't, okay? Yes, more people have died. It's a severe flu, but it is not, in my opinion, again, a pandemic. And perhaps that's where I should stop because I'm basing it on mathematics that you can take statistics and, you know, liars, figures lie and liars figure. And I'm not going to try and, uh, you know, stand by that. But, okay, where does it come? You know, your bigger question, how does uh, Bitcoin fit into this? I'll just try and keep it as simple as I can. Um, Bitcoin is freedom. Okay. Bitcoin is hope and optimism and all this other stuff is repression. It's negativity. It's fear. Um, you know, it is scary if you have an older, uh, person that is at risk. Um, but look, that is a always been a risk. People have always been at risk of dying of severe uh, respiratory disease. Is there correlations between weight? Is there correlations between smoking? I mean, a lot of these things can, can you know, again, statistically, there's significance, statistical significance. Without pointing out and, and, and identifying a single group, what we always need to ask ourselves, Kivan, is the cost of what we're doing, right? I understand there could be benefits, could, but what is the cost? What is the cost of all these skyscrapers in downtown Toronto that are empty? Literally, what is the, what is the cost to the food courts? What is the cost to the uh, owners of those properties? Like those properties certainly aren't worth what they have them marked on their books. And Guess what? Guess who owns all the property? Their pension funds. When are, when are the pension funds going to write down the value of their commercial property to reflect the fact that lots of people may never go back to work, uh, physically back to work in an office? If they're scared, that's their prerogative. But if it's because the government's making them scared, what I want to do is link up the freedom component and the... Uh, that open market um, implications of what Bitcoin is, the lack of centralized control. I think all of these uh, blend pretty well. Um, again, look, I understand people who do not want to take the vaccination and I know plenty of them. Some of them are Bitcoiners, some of them aren't. At the end of the day, I'm fine with it. They don't scare me. I'm, I have taken what I believe the precautions for myself, which includes things like using something called a nebulizer, which is a, is a mask that you put over your face and you inhale um, water mixed with uh, peroxide and some iodine. It gets stuff into your lungs to clean out infections in your lungs. Pretty effective. It's something that my family's used for a long time. Um, okay. Is it voodoo medicine? I don't know, but it, 
who says that this little vaccination is absolutely the cure all? And we don't know, as you, in your own words, something called experimental. Are we being used as a test, you know, a, a test lab for, for these things? So I, I guess if I, if I could just say Bitcoin doesn't have centralized control, people have freedom of choice uh, in the Bitcoin world, which I love. Um, does it mean that, uh, that you should align yourself one way or the other? No, because I'm a perfect example of that. I, I would not have taken the vaccination if, uh, you know, if, if it was absolutely um, voluntary. But the fact I'm 58, I'm not going to get pregnant again, or my reproductive organs are not going to be used again. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm less uh, concerned about that stuff. And if it made people around me feel safer and I didn't view the risk to myself as being anything severe. Yeah, I can do that. And I think that's how I'd like to leave the conversation on that front. If, if it's okay with you, because look, I don't know where you stand and I don't even want to ask you. And I don't actually care that much only because it's your choice. That's really the, what I want to leave you with. It's your choice. Does it make you an idiot if you've taken it? Call me an idiot if you want, but it frees up my life to be able to go on an airplane a lot easier than if I don't have the vaccination, right? Yeah. See, that, that's what I love about you, Greg, because you're honest, at least, because I know a friend who studied law with me and, and I asked him, you know, why did you, why did you get vaccinated? And because uh, you know I got, it was surprising you know and and he said listen look Kevin uh my, maybe I'm gonna just live the next 10 years I don't care but I want to you know participate in social life I want to go out but it's not about medic it's, it's it wasn't about health it, it was nothing it, 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 it wasn't about you know about health or anything or about prevention or nothing it was just like and as you said you you said the word pandemic and it's not it's not a, a damn pandemic it's a pandemic it's a pandemic of fear porn of of you know scientific fraud of of, of mass formation, mass psychosis. You know, there's this, uh, I agree. you know, wonderful Dr. Desmet who, who laid it out and, and they're just, you know, before we just uh, switch topics, there's just uh, one interview by Peter, with Peter A. McCullough on the Joe Rogan show, which everybody should, I think was pen, went pretty viral on, on Twitter, even in like three hours, like all the evidence, like on the table. And then there's wow. two books I think people should read, and there's uh, by Michael P. Sanger. I think that's a lawyer. It's called Snake Oil: How uh, whatever uh, President Xi Ping somehow you know uh, pushed this whole propaganda and everything, and and you know, and 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 literally like manipulated all the all the countries into a lockdown and all the you know with all the collateral damages, un, un, you know astronomical collateral damages. And the other book is by Robert Kennedy Jr., uh, the real Fauci. Um, it's it's mind-boggling. I mean, wow. evidence and the facts and the investigative stuff that you uh, that you understand for the first time. It's so shocking. It's so mind-boggling. It's like how the fuck could this be going on for so, for so many decades? You know? Oh, really? Okay. Decades, eh? Okay. Yeah. So, well, um, here's 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 a cost that I need to bring up. Imagine a young kid that's never seen the mouth of their teacher moving because the teacher is behind a mask and you're supposed to, you're supposed to, you know, a lot of kids learn by watching the, the, you know, when you, you, you can watch the, the movement of, of, of uh, the, the mouth in terms to understand, but when they're behind a mask, who, who knows what the, the, the long-term repercussions of that are going to be and everything. Yeah. Right. And so there are already leave. studies. And there are already studies, Greg. I mean, uh, every fifth girl, I think in Austria, there's a study that every fifth girl, I don't know whether it's teenager or what, is sort of has suicidal tendencies. You know? Oh, God. The psychological, emotional, I mean, on every level you can think the damages and the consequential damages that has been, yeah. we don't even know. You know, it, it's, so, it's so fucking criminal what has been going on. Yeah. And, you know, the more you go into the rabbit hole, it just... Uh, you know, and I, you know, well, I have, I we have a daughter, that, she's like 11 months and like, what kind of world she's going to grow up? I know. In? I, I'm going to read that Robert Kennedy book. That's a good, uh, good recommendation. So oh, you're just going to, yeah, you're just going to digest it like so fast. It's, it's so, it's, it's like written in like a, like a criminal novel, but it's like nonfiction, wow. <laughs> like all nonfiction. Okay. And, you know, it's about, you know, Bill Gates and, and all the, you know, foundation, the NGOs, UN and, and CDC and FDA and all the, you know, intricacy and how it's wow. all connected. It's super, like super, uh, yeah, uh, connected everything. Okay. 
Well, Greg, okay, let's talk about, uh, I want to talk to you about, uh, um, can you tell me, can you tell our listeners a little bit about the euro dollar? Because, you know, I, the first time I think I heard it, uh, not the first time, but a little bit in more detail is by Nick Batia, you know, okay. the author of Layered Money, you know, Brilliant Mind. But he said, you know, so tr intransparent. And uh, and I think the first time, uh, and in, I think uh, investigative journals tried to uncover this thing was in the 50s, but then the banks or the institutions told him, please don't write about this because we're making so much money. How much, yeah. I mean, how much euro dollar is there and how, what's the impact within the context which we, which you have been talking about? I mean, can, can we make analysis without knowing exactly what the euro dollar is really about? Is, is it, a, is it that's a, okay. So that's a big question of which I am not an expert. Okay. Um, and, and so I, I need to be careful here. Um, the euro dollar is offshore as it sounds, offshore U.S. dollar-denominated assets that is not controlled by the Federal Reserve, essentially, right? Um, now, there is there are implications, but certainly it's a it's an offshore funding uh, mechanism, primarily driven, in my opinion or my understanding, from the petrodollar system itself, right? The fact that oil is denominated in U.S. dollars or energy is. And so there's offshore settlements uh, in, in dollars that, uh, as they are rightly termed, euro, they are Eurocentric um, transactions. There's something called the London, uh, the LIBOR rate, London Interbank Offered Rate on, there's Euribor, and that's Euro dollar. And then there's LIBOR, which is basically US dollars priced in London. It's, it's, it's been there for a long time. Um, and what you need to understand is um, the Fed implications domestically obviously leak over to the rest of the world. Um, it's largely uncontrollable. Uh, These dollars can be created by foreign banks um, based off of flows like petrodollars, right? So um, there's a very well-developed system. It, it's I'm comfortable with it to the context that I think, and we're going to tie this in with Bitcoin. Um, I think that Bitcoin is going to be used by the world as the store of value savings account, right? And I still see a day that you need a checking account that will be fiat US based, okay? Um, and why do you need a checking account? Well, basically you don't, you know, you want to eliminate the need for barter. Uh, you want to transact global trade flows in, uh, in, in something that doesn't require trading boats for uh, cars, etc. So you do it in a currency. Uh, right now, the global currency is, uh, is uh, the US dollar. And if the United States were to embrace Bitcoin as a store of value savings account, I believe it would strengthen the uh, desire, I should say, to maintain the US dollar as fiat currency checking account, okay? It would strengthen that position and it would actually strengthen the United States. It would allow for trade flows to, uh, to still be uh, essentially... Um, uh, consummated in U.S. dollars, if that's the way to do it. Now, does it mean that all energy will be priced in U.S. dollars or will energy someday be priced in Bitcoin? That's a bit of a, I'll throw that out for people to contemplate. When energy is priced in Bitcoin, which I think is a natural as an engineer, um, there may be time when oil and gas is priced in Bitcoin because natural resource energy for digital energy makes sense from my perspective but you'll still need a fiat reserve currency. And this is key. Um, there's too many fiat currencies in the world right now. Uh, clearly there's too many because some of them are failing. Some of them are uncontrolled and too many of them really are just a proxy for the US dollar to, to begin with. And you look at stuff that's happened in Turkey recently, okay? I mean, those poor people have been exposed to absolutely horrendous currency management practices on behalf, uh, you know, by the government. And the world could actually be a better place if you had fewer fiats, but you still have one dominant fiat, which is the US dollar. 
Um, and Michael Saylor has made that argument. He says that if the U.S. dollar were, were to embrace the Bitcoin standard, he thinks that, uh, excuse me, if the U.S. government was to embrace the Bitcoin standard, he thinks that would uh, allow for a continuation of the dominance of the U.S. dollar as reserve currency. And incidentally, the average age of a reserve currency is about 100 years. Just I know it's not statistically significant because, you know, you've gone from the, the pound to the U.S. dollar to prior, uh, prior reserve currencies, essentially. But the U.S. dollar is bumping up right on that 100-year uh, time frame as being the global reserve currency, which tends to say there's going to be another one that comes down the path at some point. Um, I don't want the U.S. dollar to fail. I've said that many times. Uh, the U.S. dollar is the best house on a crack street, right? Like it's a, it's a street full of crack addicts where people are printing money to solve their various problems in, in other countries. The U.S. dollar is doing the same, but it's still the best house on a crack street. And we need that. Uh, Canada needs it. That's where I live. Um, and the, the, the world needs it. So is the US dollar, uh, sorry, the Euro dollar a natural progression of that uh, uh, model that I'm laying out? Yeah, it is. Um, and it, it, it will still be utilized. And look, um, where do all the trading of these Euro dollars take place? Well, primarily in the big money center banks in Europe, and rightly so. So I don't understand the market per se. I've never traded Euro dollars. I've watched Euro dollar futures. I mean, there's lots of different credit signs that come out of that market. Uh, as far as it and its implications for the world, hard for me to pin it down, like hard for me to put my finger exactly on what would happen. But when I layer it into my viewpoint of, again, Store of value savings account called Bitcoin, 21 million. Anyone who owns it, that's where you store your value. Checking account, fiat, US dollars. Canada would be better off if we actually were on US dollars, okay? All our trade flows are with primarily with the United States. This currency is nothing more than the banks arbing the heck out of every single cross-border arbitrage or uh uh, trade flow and the volatility of the Canadian dollar just in the last 20 years. At one point, we were trading at 114 cents Canadian, meaning, sorry, US. So $1 Canadian was worth 114 cents US. Now we're worth under 80 cents. And that's, <clears throat> excuse me, big volatility. And what does that do? makes it harder to plan for cross-border uh, uh, cash flows. If your biggest customer is in the U.S., you're always worried about FX rates and everything. So look, I think it would be good for Canada. And Canada is a G7 nation. Does that mean it's better for other countries, you know, 7 through 25? I think it could. we could make that argument. Greg, um, now I understand that, you know, and I've listened, you know, to pretty much, you know, especially the last interview with uh, Michael Saylor on uh, with uh, <coughs> on, on what's what's um, on Safida Namu's podcast it was pretty amazing, um, and and he lays it out. He emphasizes, you know, this why you know why shouldn't you know the U.S. dollar because it is the you know dominating reserve. It, it is the, the it is the you know the dominating reserve currency and. And and all trades, you know, have been like what 80, 90 percent of all trades in US dollars. So, uh, but I mean, my question is: Is it would it be is it necessary or um, or is it um, or is it because it's realistic? You know, sort of. In um, I think it's realistic. Yes. Um, I mean, is it more efficient? Hundred percent, it's more efficient. Okay, but you do lose a. Uh, a lot of control, meaning the U.S. dollar was Canada's essential, essentially their currency. Well, then interest rate policy and Federal Reserve or and, and central bank policy is set out of the United States, right? We lose the ability to print our own currency, which, you know, 
I'm, I'm not that, I wouldn't be that upset about. Um, indirectly, Canada trades almost lockstep with the US anyway. Um, in terms of GDP, like, look, Canada will never not be in recession if the USA is in recession. Pretty certain. I mean, there could be a scenario where oil is so, you know, so high and our natural resource prices are so high, but that doesn't last long. We saw how that worked out in 2007 when the Canadian dollar was at 114. Uh, it took 114 US, 114 cents US to buy one Canadian dollar. It was when oil was way through 100 bucks. It didn't last long. I remember growing up when my father told me, Greg, if the Canadian dollar ever trades at parity with the US dollar, meaning one for one, you should take a portion of your savings and move it into US dollars. And it was good advice. I mean, there was a time when you move it in at a dollar, it goes to a dollar five, you move more in at a dollar five, a dollar 10, but then it craps the bed and it's back to where it has been historically, which is at a discount to the US, uh, to the US currency. Um, again, look, the banks aren't going to want this, Kivan. They don't want this because probably their biggest profit source in commercial banks is foreign exchange and raping the captive clientele that they have when Canadians are trying to buy and sell. And I'm talking average Canadians, not a corporate treasurer who has uh, access to different bank lines at different uh, financial institutions. I'm talking the guy that goes to the bank and wants to do a $100,000 transaction this way or that, you're captive on a bid offer spread that's almost three points, meaning they'll make $3,000 off of you. Holy crap. And no one knows this. They don't understand how this works, but it's a very big profit center for the commercial banks. And, uh, you know, they're not going to give it up easily on that front either. But as far as good for my kids... Yeah, it would be, in my opinion, good for my kids uh, to, to have a U.S. dollar standard in Canada. I oh, got you. OK, so you were talking about like the euro dollar was um, there's something else that I think Nick Bartia said on the Jimmy Song podcast, like he said that people uh, in Europe or or actually, you know, the talking about he was talking about the European Central Bank and he said he uh, what people don't want to hear in within, I think, uh, the European Central Bank is that the European Central Bank is actually an extended arm, a sort of a subjugated or, or obedient, like, um, extended arm of the Federal Reserve. Yeah, no, that's fine. It has to be, right? As, as okay. Canada is. I mean, Canada's G7. Most of those other countries are G6, G5, G4, G3, G2 being uh, Japan, except that China's really G2. But the point is this, look, you have that centralized uh, European Central Bank that Number one is the USA. It's just the way it works. It's the biggest economy in the world. So everything else is going to trade off of that big, not only the biggest, it's the most powerful military. It's the most, it's the richest nation per capita. And it's, uh, it's, it controls, it's, it's, it doesn't have a border. It has two borders and then an, an ocean around it, right? Like it, there's just so many things about the US that, that make it natural for it to be able to maintain its global currency dominance. What it means then is every other central bank is essentially subservient to what Fed policy is. Is Canada ever going to be raising rates when the U.S. is not raising rates or is lowering rates? Very unlikely. It's possible, but it won't last long. And, and that's just the way markets work, okay? Because you always have to look at what the biggest, most powerful, most protected nation is doing. And that's the United States. So could could the Fed, uh, could the U.S. Fed like do something to, I mean, we know that uh, pension funds or, the, you know, the European Union is 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 insolvent. I mean, they're, I think they're bad. <laughs> do right? you know that? I mean, I believe they are. I've never done the work, but every other bank is. So why wouldn't that bank be as well, right? Yeah. You know, you look at things like, I was convinced in the uh, right after the great financial crisis that the next move was going to be the pigs, right? You remember Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. Those four countries were were really teetering, 
And then uh, Draghi came out and said famously, he will do whatever it takes to to keep those pigs within uh, the European Union. So Germany essentially funds the credit quality of Spain and Greece, Portugal, Italy for sure, but Italy is a G7. So, you know, yes, you have um, before you had this, this concern that it was going to fall apart. And was it insolvent then? Yeah, on the surface, I could easily tell you based on where credit default swap spreads were trading back then that there was a lot of concern about the pigs. And now that the pigs are consolidated within this European Union, we will do whatever it takes. Germany's just not strong enough to hold the whole thing together. So is it a matter of time until we see like real cracks or do you think- uh, Well, we're seeing it right now. Okay, maybe. look, look, don't over or underestimate the knock-on effects that something like Turkey is going to have. Right. So they have okay, officially had inflation, serious. right? Because I think it was Lean Alden who said like 50% onwards, then it's a sort of, I mean, I don't know, is it the definition of hype inflation? Is it 50% like when it, when a currency loses? Anything like I, I just don't even know, but that number, think about it. Inflation compounds, Kivan, that's key, right? Inflation compounds. So imagine if it even is something 20% annualized. 20%, then the next year, 20% on top of 20%. It takes four years for you to have doubled your, uh, it takes 11 years at 10%. Sorry, it takes nine years at 10%. So it'll take uh, uh, something like four years at 20% to, to double your, your, your actual inflation over that period, okay? It's a, I've forgotten the rule, it's a, a factor of something. But the point is, at a 20% inflation rate, it takes four years for everything to have doubled in price. Holy crap, you can't, you can't possibly keep pace with that. You can't even control it. There was this article that Marty Bent put out today that was really interesting about the Weimar Republic uh, implications in New York City, mm -hmm. where a bicycle shop, I don't know if you read that, about the components that go into a bicycle. Yeah crazy this is crazy people delaying purchases because they think that inflation will magically come back down remember it compounds even if, if it goes from 20 percent this year down to 10 percent next year you can't wait to buy it next year because it's essentially over 30 percent total inflation so what does that mean? It means it leads to incre increased purchasing uh, supply chain disruptions right now. Everything that we're, we're seeing in the markets are taking place right now. This is the result of idiot professors pushing this modern monetary theory bullshit. And the population is now understanding the severity of having these armchair economists that have never sat in a risk chair publishing books on stuff that they have no experience in, absolutely no expertise in uh, publishing. So this whole thing about the deficit myth by uh, Stephanie Kelton, damn, what an absolute disaster. That's garbage. I mean, it's totally garbage. I mean, you know, just follow the money, follow the incentives. Yes. And, yeah. Um, and again, and, and look, she works at some two-bit Stony Brook College uh, professor and she, she was a brand and everyone wanted to believe she was right. Because why? It's a fairy tale. Right. The only thing I just don't psychologically, I don't understand, like, how can people like save their face? I mean, you know, when everything just crumbles. I don't know. They just pretend that, oh, it was some, some other problem, right? Like, I mean, how is Joe Biden uh, blaming uh, blaming inflation? The last thing I saw, he said something like, Oh, it's on these greedy corporations that are trying to raise prices and take advantage of the COVID, the COVID supply uh, issues. Man, I mean, talk about a disingenuous commentary, but you know, some yeah, people and, will. Yeah, and on top of that, you know, Biden, I mean, is like mentally, and I don't know. If, uh, I, I, I won't go there either because look, there's. Uh, I know he has a speech impediment, and that's fine. But he is definitely mathematically, he is pushing the uh, the the. Uh, uh, 
era or the, you know, the human level of where you start being uh, impacted by uh, some degenerative diseases. Uh, don't want to go there. Mm-hmm. Understand that uh, I, uh, I believe that a lot of these problems are the result of failed monetary policy, not altogether failed political policy. It's a combination of both. And uh, look, I, uh, I'm a Republican as a capitalist, but I'm a Democrat at heart. I understand the need to help, um, uh, a, a, you know, the less fortunate and everything. And some of these programs were absolutely necessary to help the less fortunate, but you got to know when to stop, man. You got, you can't be an illiterate. You cannot be a math illiterate and not understand the implications for, uh, future generations. And that's what really makes me upset, right? Key man is again, I'll say it. I'm a boomer. I am a boomer and I'm a selfish old fuck. Okay. Because all boomers are pulling forward gains at the expense of our children. And someone should actually stand up and say enough. Okay. We've never fought a war, my generation, okay? We've never done anything that absolutely prior generations, you know, the greatest generation fought two world wars. They were through a nuclear uh, cold war. You know, we've been very, very spoiled. And what are we doing right now? We're trying to be even more spoiled. We can't even bite the bullet. We can't even, you know, oh, protect me, Mr. Government. What a bunch of softies, okay? Boomers are so soft. And I'm a boomer. So what's going to happen? Because I would, I think I mentioned just shortly the, the pension funds. Um, if they are all broke, I mean, if, they have, if, they, if uh-huh. like trillions and trillions have been siphoned off, how is this going to, I mean, there's like, people and pensioners yeah okay look so medicare and medicaid in the usa right so total total debt in the usa funded debt is just under 30 trillion but their unfunded liabilities medicare and medicaid is 160 trillion five times the size and i promise you there's a lot of americans that are counting on medicare and medicaid to be there when they need help it's not going to be there it's mathematically impossible for it to be there. And it if, and if it is there, it's because your currency has gone from today, let's just use a number of one, it's gone down to a value of like 0.35, okay? Yeah, you can have all this Medicare if you want, but the purchasing power of your dollar has just been cut in more than a half. And this is on top of a debasement over time of 95% up until now. So what does it mean? Social, existential, I mean, catastrophic. Okay, you can do this, but understand that it's pulling forward stuff for the present social welfare at the expense of the future. Right. It's possible to do it until it isn't, until until some lender finally says, enough, I am not lending a dollar more to the U.S. Treasury. And by the way, I already have all this dollars that I've lent to them. The U.S. Treasury could say, okay, I'm going to fund myself. What are they going to do with all the selling of the bondholders who decide that not only are they not going to roll their debt, they actually want out of it now? That's when it ends. And I don't want it to happen. But all of this stuff about it can't possibly happen. Damn, these people have not traded risk. They haven't seen when everyone, including Alan Greenspan, said, we think the uh, subprime mortgage contagion is largely contained. Three months later, it's an absolute disaster in the markets. And another six months after that, approximately, Lehman Brothers files for bankruptcy. Don't listen to these people. It doesn't continue forever. Finally, the markets go, you know what? It's not true. So this is my biggest concern. And and we talked about that at the outset. We don't want the failure. We need a parallel system to develop because it's not ready yet. It's developing. We know what it's called. It's called the Bitcoin standard. But in the interim, you need a parallel network. And in a network transfer, 
you don't turn one network off and immediately go all in on another network, right? You run two networks in parallel and you allow those networks to uh, develop and feed off of each other. And then potentially in the long run, those two networks can become the global standard. But you certainly don't turn one off unless the market turns it off for you. And that's the big risk, Yvette. Right, right. And that's it, that realistic and rule. also necessary because otherwise people are going to suffer, right? I mean, no, no, people are going to suffer either way. That's the biggest problem. Really? Like on the same oh, it's, level? It's, like it's mathematical certainty that people are going to suffer. Mm -hmm. Starting now, even if the most optimistic scenario plays out, people are going to suffer. And why is it right now? Because not enough people own Bitcoin. And the government hasn't taken it upon themselves to embrace Bitcoin. Now, once they do, then there's hope that people won't suffer as much. But until that happens, which is not now, people are going to suffer. Let me ask you, before I ask you something about El Salvador, you know, in this triggering phase, like what it could uh, somehow um, uh, trigger. Um, I want to ask you about, um, you know, BlackRock, you know, these these huge, gigantic yeah. uh, asset managers, like, like in total, I think they're, they, they, they manage, what, 20, 30 uh, trillion dollars or something? How it sounds this, about right. I mean, there's, like, there's trillion dollar asset managers out there. Yeah. Yeah. So how does this play into this? I mean, how, without going into conspiracy theory, any, but just, just, just look at the facts. Like how, you know, they profit off. I mean, if they can buy penny on a dollar, if you, I think that's the term they, <laughs> what we can use, uh, and buy up everything is, I mean, isn't that like a welcome, uh, process taking place right now for all these little black rock? What is it? It's, uh, Van Eck and I think street Vanguard. You might be thinking of Vanguard, Vanguard and main uh, street, main main street or something like that. Or uh, I don't know. Well, just... the two big ones are black rock and Vanguard. Um, uh, oh. they're, but, but they're largely passive investment indexes, right? So first of all, they're not buying anything. Uh, they're just buying a mix of the S and P let's say they're an S and P product. Um, they're just mathematically buying formulaic buying of the shares of the companies according to that weight in the S&P 500 index. And on that, they're able to charge a very thin management fee relative to other equity managers that might charge 1% annually. These ETFs charge management expense ratios that are substantially lower. And it's proven that over time, fees are a large cost in running money. The problem is when you pay somebody a very low fee, you get what you pay for in something like Western Union. Okay, Western Union's part of the S&P 500. Western Union, in my opinion, is gone. It's, it's, there's no rationale for that company to trade anywhere near its $6 billion market cap. Yet the two largest owners are Vanguard and BlackRock on behalf of their passive investing styles, which just means that Western Union is a certain component of the S&P 500. Therefore, they're going to mimic this weighting in their portfolio to follow the performance of the S&P 500. Over time, that'll take care of itself. But where they really make their money is by charging seven let's say 10 basis points on trillions of dollars of AUM. That's not like, it's not like they're out in the market picking off people. No, they're doing it on a formulaic basis on the passive side. Then on the active investing side, that's where people pretend that they can add value if they, uh, you know, if they're not actually adding value, they pretend they are. But some really good managers absolutely add value all the time. Oh, talk about some of the hedge fund managers that I view as being absolute market uh, savants. Um, a guy like Leon Cooperman, Lee Cooperman says that the value, he views the value of the S&P, the fair value of the S&P to be 4,100. It currently trades at about 4,600, which means the S&P is overvalued by 500 points in his view and 500 points on 4,500, it's one ninth. So it's just over 10, call it 11% overvalued. The question is, if the S&P is overvalued, where does the money go? 
because it shouldn't be going to bonds. Bonds are the stupidest investment I've ever seen in 30 years of trading bonds. Okay. First of all, high yield is ridiculously low yield. And after you price for defaults on a nominal basis, your returns are likely to be negative at some point in the next five years, not even on a real basis, on a nominal basis because of defaults. And it just goes down the spectrum. It's like, well, I can't put money in high yield, but I have money in high yield because I'm mandated to do it, but I don't want to put more money there. So then I put it into equities and it just keeps pushing up on this. The only real uh, asset that these guys have a chance of outperforming their blended return. Bonds are fixed. That's why they call it fixed income. The contractual returns on bonds are known. And that's why CalPERS, for example, is starting to leverage <laughs> their equity exposure. Man, what could possibly go wrong, right? Oh, my Lord. What a bunch of knuckleheads. Yet you have this beautiful, pristine asset right on the other side that no one's jumped into yet in any meaningful way called Bitcoin, which could solve so many of these problems. BlackRock will get there. So will Vanguard, but they'll be the last ones to get there because they're passive. They're followers. They are not the, uh, uh, the alternative asset managers or the active asset managers. Gotcha. So, um, why, why aren't there more institutions or corporations like, I mean, you know, Michael Saylor and Michael Strait, I mean, it's a unique position, I guess, and unique, uh, structure, um, I guess, because of his whatever, uh, controlling rights yeah. or voting. Why, why don't and we his or big do you, brain? Do you know don't forget his big brain. Okay. Yeah. It takes a lot to have a brain the size of Michael Saylor. There's not a lot of CEOs out there that are rocket scientists. Okay. Let's just be honest. There are not a lot of rocket scientist CEOs. Um, I, I just wanted to stop you. You say, why aren't there more? But well, let's look at what they what Bitcoin's already accomplished in the last 10 years, 12 years. There's a country that uses it. Holy crap. A country. Yeah. A country has leapfrogged hedge funds and other corporations. That's why I wanted to ask you about the Volcano bonds. I mean, uh, because Michael Saylor, I think, was asked and he said, well, uh, he, he, I'm not sure whether he, he wanted to position himself like what he realized, but he thought like, why don't they just buy Bitcoin? And I'm like, well, how else are, are they going to build the infrastructure? Like that's the right. private cities, the Bitcoins are like to welcome, that's or to, right. what do we call, call it? To entice, inspire people to come. I mean, I, we would, we are thinking literally like if everything goes wrong, we would, we were thinking here, about here, El Salvador. Here, here's the thing, the, the, the El Salvador is tied to the US dollar. So they can't essentially print their own currency. So what do they buy it with? If, if, the, if the cupboard is bare, if they don't have excess US dollars there, how do they buy it? You can't just, they don't have free cash flow. They're not free cash flow positive like micro strategy is. So it would be nice for them to buy it, but essentially someone needs to lend them the money to buy it. And right now in the open market on their straight fiat bonds, those are trading at like a 13% yield to maturity. And no one's giving them more money at 13%. So they had to come to the market with a hybrid instrument called a volcano bond. It was provided optionality on the performance of Bitcoin. Very smart structure. My opinion, six and a half percent yield. You know, that compensates for uh, the difference between six and a half percent and 13 percent in on the other bonds is the optionality and the performance of Bitcoin price. It's a smart solution. The last I saw is about half of the issue had been spoken for. So they're trying to raise a billion and it looks like they've raised, you know, somewhere in the area of 400 to 500 million. That's a great start because the IMF is holding them hostage. And if they can prove that they can fund themselves on this structure, it's going to be massive, in my opinion. And other countries that are held hostage by the IMF will look at it and say, wow, that was something. And so, I, you know, I take issue only with the fact that Bitcoiners, a lot of them want everything to happen in, in a compressed time frame. And what I try and do is say, look, I'm playing this game for the next 20 years. And as far as I'm concerned, man, there's been some great adoption. Let's look at the positive adoption that I just read about in the last month. 
The German banks are coming in a very big way to Bitcoin. Okay, you have um, uh, hedge funds. Even Ray Dalio admitted he personally owns Bitcoin and Ethereum. Like it doesn't fall on deaf ears when these people are doing this. Why are they doing it? Because there's demand out there. Okay, Kevin, it's that simple. Banks are not doing it because they know it's going to cannibalize their business. They know they're doing it because they know they have demand for it. And if they don't do it, someone else will. Um, that's okay. Fascinating. So, um, so do you think, um, I mean, do you think it's just a matter of time uh, until other, let's just say, smaller countries within, let's say, yes. whatever, South Africa or or uh, or or, uh, or Africa? Imagine if Turkey had been smart enough to start this before they imploded. Right. Imagine if Turkey had some store of value on their balance sheet right now, that, so that the lira wasn't just absolutely getting crushed. It would be awesome. You know, imagine if Canada had some. This is where I'm pushing. Uh, I want Canada to put some on their balance sheet. And as soon as Canada does, it's going to be a game theory, a conundrum. What other country does it before? So the smartest thing the USA could do is put it on their balance sheet in as covertly as possible. I, I think it would be difficult to actually do it that covertly. But other countries are going to try and front run the United States, in my opinion. But the United States would be the biggest beneficiary of the Chinese and all the silly Chinese Communist Party uh, policies against Bitcoin. The USA could embrace this. There's a, a younger kid, uh, Jason Lowry, who I hope you read yeah, if you don't. Of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant kid brilliant, yeah. about how uh, um, Bitcoin is actually mutually assured preservation. Mm -hmm. Whereas other military options to preserve protection of property rights and everything is mutually assured destruction. Both of everyone's sitting with their finger on the nuclear arsenal, and that's the deterrent. If they fire their missile, I'm going to fire mine. That's that's a pretty shitty <laughs> deterrent, right? Like, I mean, you know, it, it's over. Whereas Bitcoin could be described as mutually assured preservation, where one country could actually benefit and another country benefits by having a substantial stock of Bitcoin to protect their property rights and actually alleviate the need for kinetic force military. I'd love okay. to talk with Jason. I mean, because um, I mean, he. I, mean, I think there's some specific topics or questions because he's just been cleared. I think by his employer, Space Force. To That's right. So he went on the pop broadcast. I mean, I've met with Jason in Boston. Mm -hmm. Very, very impressive young man. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know how the U.S. Space Force works, and I know there's a certain level of uh, uh, of concern. But the fact that he got on the pop broadcast and he was wearing his military fatigue. Yeah. That's amazing. He had yeah. his little name tag yeah. there and stuff. Someone there is listening, and I'll tell you, I have enough DM messages from other people in the U.S. military really? to know that there's people looking at this. Okay, uh -huh. interesting, and it's good. And and then I won't I won't go further down that rabbit hole. But I've given a presentation to 45 members of Parliament in Canada yeah, about imagine. the benefits of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Damn, would I love that party to come into power and move Canada, move the needle on Canada to allow Canada to advance to a level that I, you know, I, I hope happens. And I'm working, uh, I'm not working with Jeff Booth, but Jeff Booth and I are, are, are good friends. I was friends just going to Canada. mention Jeff Booth because I was, I was, I was thinking the three of you, you, Jeff Booth and Jason Lurie, that would be, because you know what, there's an aspect that fascinates me and that I think it's so overdue, like that, uh, you know, because, you know, Jeff Booth talks about abundance, deflation, you know, it's, it's the, 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 the title of his book, you know, is the, yeah. the deflation is the key to an, uh, you know, to an abundant future. It's like, how can we, especially with Jason within the middle, but that's a question of whether he can, you know, go, I, I think, I don't even think he's been sort of cleared or he, he doesn't have the top secret clearance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what really fascinates me is the technological innovation that could just be unleashed through, you know, this. Oh, it would be huge. And and by the way, uh, it's, it's, it's flattering to be included with those two. Look, they both have really big brains. Okay. I'll leave it to them to iron out those details. 
Jeff Booth and I work well together because he's re really smart and I'm just really aggressive. Uh, and then he tells me, hey, hey, buddy, and he taps me on the shoulder. He says, you don't have to run through that wall. You know, we can go around the wall, right? And uh, you know what I have is just a lot of experience trading risk. Um, I'm, I'm decent in mathematics. Jeff Booth is eloquent. He could be a politician if he wanted to. I don't think he wants to, but he'd be a really good politician. I know for certain I'd be a horrible politician, um, perhaps because I'm, you know, I speak my mind a lot of times. Um, but that's what a trader does, right? Like I'm pretty easy to, uh, uh, you, you, I solve my problem by selling something. If I don't like it anymore, I sell it. That's it. It's over. I don't care what it does after I've exited my position. I've made my mind up. It was time to sell. Um, you have to get that level of uh, uh, indifference if you're going to properly trade risk, okay? Because you make your decision and then you execute your plan and you can't look back. Your decision's been made. Sometimes you make the right decision. Sometimes you make the wrong decision. If I've done anything well in my trading career, it's that I probably made the right decision maybe 60% of the time, six zero, which made which meant I made the wrong decision 40% of the time. But the reason I survived is because most people flip it. They're horrible traders. They keep their they, they keep their losers and sell their winners. It's the hardest thing to do. Yeah. And in, that must be like nerve nerve wracking. I mean, like, like it's not easy, especially when you're managing other people's pressure. money and and their right. livelihood depends on it. Their children's uh, university tuition depends on it, and you're trying to do your best. And sometimes the market just takes you out and whoops you. And you know, it's not like you want to lose that money. The worst thing is though is someone sitting in a risk chair like Peter Schiff, who admitted to me on a on a debate that he didn't care. He did not care that he's been a horrible yeah. allocator yeah. or risk manager. He goes, uh, quite frankly, I don't care. Man, oh man, if I ever heard one of my, uh, you know, portfolio managers say that he didn't care about properly managing risks, my, my assets, I take them back and I'm like, I would never send anybody that way. Because those people who don't care about properly managing risk, what do you think their performance looks like? Sort of like Peter Schiff's, horrible. Is it true that uh, it's just 5% of gold that he um, sort of uh, has in his portfolio? Um, I'm not really sure what his absolute portfolio is. I know what his performance returns have been. Uh -huh. And I also know that if he had put just 1% of his portfolio in Bitcoin, when he first was introduced to Bitcoin, he'd be by far the best performing asset manager in the gold space, hands down. Yeah. Okay, it would be up 10,000 percent, 10,000 times on. Okay, uh, okay, let's it would be up a thousand times on one percent. Yeah, it should okay? have listened to which Mac means guys. His whole portfolio, to, yeah, <laughs> his whole portfolio would be up tenfold on a one percent allocation. Tenfold, yeah, Instead, thankfully, he's flat. He, thankfully, his son is um, uh, yeah, much more wise. I, I like his son, I, 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 I can't. Yeah determine whether I've actually interacted with him or one of his secretaries, but I do have a, an open uh, a DM going with Spencer. I'm a fan of Spencer's. Um, I don't have any ill will towards Peter Schiff Sr. Um, the, my biggest ill will is the money he's cost other people by listening to his advice on Bitcoin when he may well have known better. That's right. the problem. Right. He's conflicted. He's giving poor investment advice based on his conflict, not what he's actually processed in his brain. Um, but let's leave that there, Kivan. Um, yeah. uh, how about we we wrap this up in the next yeah, 10 minutes? Yeah, let's wrap this up. Just before we wrap up, uh, let me just go back to El Salvador because that was an important question I had. Like, Okay, once El Salvador proves you know, to the world that they can, you know, make themselves independent from the central bank structure, from the IMF, um, and, you know, build up infrastructure, you know, and, and flourish, make, make this, you know, the country flourish. You think this, this will just trigger, or do you think in, in that, within that time frame, other small countries are just going to catch up? Hard, hard to say. I think it's a process. This is definitely an, an, uh, a very uh, ambitious process. I'm very happy to see the order book where it is. I hope it's real. 
The point is, even if they don't get to a billion, should they do 500 million? Absolutely, you should do 500 million, okay? And that is really a very small percentage of total global debt, okay? So 1 billion, total global debt is 400 trillion. Despite what the IMF says, total global debt is actually 400 trillion. They've come out and said it was 256 trillion. That is wrong. According to the Institute of International Finance, it's 400 trillion, okay? And El Salvador is trying to raise 1 billion, okay? 1 billion is four, one forty thousandth of total global debt. One forty thousandth. Man, they'll do it. It's going to change a lot of capital market thinking. And you can't do it all at once. It's a process, you know? A billion is not that much in the context of total global debt, but it's a lot in the context of El Salvador. Really I really hope forward. it succeeds. Yeah. This is an exciting process because there's, I think once they, you know, uh, make, you know, create the structures so that people, you really feel invited to come, you know, with the families, with the children. Oh, uh, that's even, a, that's a tertiary or a secondary, probably a tertiary uh, uh, positive, okay. right? Yeah. Um, anyone with three bit Bitcoin gets automatic uh, right. uh, citizenship. But that's not in the here and now. That's that's adding to their GDP going going forward. Mm -hmm. What they're really solving right now, the biggest one for me is this. Let's just run through the mathematics of this. Mm -hmm. Total remittances back to El Salvador. So that's by by um, uh, immigrant workers. Let's say primarily working in the United States, sending money back to their home country of El Salvador for family members. <coughs> Excuse me is 20% of GDP, okay? Now their GDP is, you know, they got 6 million people. It's really the GDP of less than the uh, GDP of uh, Toronto, okay? You know, I mean, it's it's meaningful, but on a global scale, it's, it's pretty small. But 20% of their GDP is remittances, of which Western Union start to finish charges 20% fee. So 20% of 20%, you do your math, 0.2 times 0.2 equals 0.04. 0.04 is 4%. If all of those remittances are taken off the Western Union payment rail and done via the Bitcoin payment rail, 4% increase in their GDP just because of that. That's now, wow. more exciting. Yeah, I run a restaurant business in Canada. I, I don't run it. I'm a partner in it. Uh -huh. We pay 2.5% merchant fees which means every time someone takes out their credit card, our profitability margins are around 14%, okay? EBITDA margins, which means of every dollar we sell, we make about 14 cents of profit. If someone takes out and pays with a credit card, that 14 cents goes down to 11 and a half cents. Gee, that's a rip -off. Meaningful, yeah. that's in Canada. Gee, that's in El Salvador, <laughs> they are 8% right. merchant fees, Right. 8%. So if you're a good restaurant in El Salvador, let's say you're still doing 14% EBITDA margins, all of a sudden someone pays with a credit card, your EBITDA margin goes down to under seven. Damn. Imagine what Bitcoin's going to do for that side of the economy. So those are two real things. Mm -hmm. Remittances, Visa merchant fees, Visa MasterCard merchant fees. And then we talked about the citizenship and attracting wealthy uh, foreigners to become citizens of El Salvador. These are all things that add over time. That's a beautiful vision. That's, let's leave it at that. Any final thoughts? Thank you so much again, uh, Greg. It was amazing. Really enjoyed it. Oh, it's, uh, thank you for asking some thought-provoking questions. Um, look, I'm, I'm just really excited to be part of this. Uh, uh, I've met so many really, really strong people and it keeps getting stronger by the week, okay? Uh, the guys like Jason Lowry joining our community. I mean, some people disagree with his views. I promise you, though, he's got a huge brain. And in my opinion, his heart is in the right place. He talks about war, which turns some people off. But the reality is history is full of wars. And wars are generally fought with kinetic force. And they are trying to plunder the the property rights of another nation okay right. i mean we can create peace through this uh, you okay know. i agree with that too um <laughs> uh, but th this community is getting so much stronger so quickly i i just continue to be introduced to uh 
really, really, really uh, smart and motivated people who try and change the world uh, and make it better. They look again, I'm selfish, man. I'm selfish because I'm a boomer and I'm trying to make amends for that. <laughs> Fuck you boomers who are pulling forward right. all the riches that should accrue to our children because you're soft. Okay. Yeah. Get off your couch, you lazy old boomers, and start doing something. Right. For once, start doing something. So and thanks for, for our having children. me. At the end of the day, to be honest with you, I mean, it's it's about our children, you know? I mean, and your That's children. all it's ever been about. This is, this is our only mission, to be honest. That's what humans are supposed to do to right. ensure survival. Exactly. We don't use everything up right now. We actually try and make things better for the future and for our future uh, uh, generations, right? Greg. I love you, brother. <laughs> Thank you for having Thanks me. So I love much. you guys and uh, I look forward to talking in the new year, okay? Yeah. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. All right. Happy Thank holidays, you. buddy. Thank you for having me. Bye, Greg. All right. So, uh, listen, guys, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, don't forget to order your books by Safida Namus. I think it's, uh, it's a brilliant book. I think it's even better formulated than the Bitcoin standard uh, because it goes really to the root causes, root comprehension. Uh, I got it right here. I'm not sure whether you can see it because of the background. I have it, the fiat standard, the debt slavery, alternative human civilization. Of course, the Bitcoin standard was his first book. Um, it's a it's a it's a mind boggling book. So I just started it and uh, it I think I, just, you know, buy it for Christmas for your whether family friends <laughs> before, you know, you get you get into any uh, animosities or discussions, debates because it's, you know, nonsensical. And yeah, the other three books, you know, for bigger, comprehensive, more interconnected uh, is uh, by Robert Kennedy Jr. Again, which I mentioned uh, the real Fauci. Uh, with a, I don't know the subtitle and and the other book is Michael P. Sanger, uh, Snake Oil, about you know President Xi and uh, the Communist Party in China, how they you know somehow uh, manipulated the whole world into lockdown and and uh, you know and, and everything else. So uh, and yeah, and there's this interview with on Joe Rogan with Peter McCullough. I think was pretty viral and you should watch it and uh, share it with everybody you know because it's like super solid evidence and yeah so my name is Kay Van Davani. this is the Kay Van Davani Connection Show thank you so much again for listening please share subscribe follow me on Twitter follow uh, Greg Foss on Twitter he's got an enormous vast uh, uh, cosmic <laughs> Uh, knowledge, especially when it comes to math and uh, you know rational thinking, logical thinking, and buy Bitcoin. That's the only thing you need to do. And uh, thank you so much again. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. If we don't hear from one another, and if you have any suggestions for future, um, you know, for uh, bigger picture to to communicate the bigger picture to make people uh, comprehend, let me know what experts or or you know. Uh, macroeconomy, geopoliticians, investigative journalists you want to have on. So I'm, I'm going to try to get them on my show. So thank you so much again and have a wonderful day.